I like this disclaimer because it absolves me of all responsibility. So those of you familiar with ZFS may feel that I'm not fully covering some issues and that's by, on purpose because this is for newbies. I can't, I can't go into detail. So you'll hear me say something and you'll say, D don't, <coughs> because it's not relevant to newbies. It'll be relevant to them once they've been using it for a while, but if you're a newbie, those little esoteric things that I've not mentioned or glossed over aren't relevant because I am grossly simplifying. So I will admit stuff and there will be options skipped because this is a talk for newbies. Okay. So what we're going to cover, we're going to cover all that. It, that's just a copy of what was in the, in the um, program. So. Started as Sun Microsystems. 2008, it became a part of FreeBSD. And I don't really know when I started it. Uh, sometime between 2008 and March 2010. I don't know where in there, but I, I just remember what I was doing at the time. Uh, not listed in this list is the Sun, is the Oracle acquisition of Sun. And ZFS is still developed in house there. And most of the open uh, ZFS development now occurs under the Open ZFS project. This is stuff you can look up. Basically, you're not going to run out. Of, you're going to run out of hardware before you run out of a address space in ZFS. Um, ZFS is not RAID. Don't think of it as RAID. Think of it as redundancy. Uh, basically, you put your drives together into a pool, which we call a Z pool. Um, you can create a mirror consisting of uh, two to n drives. You can create a RAID Z, which mean, which usually has a number one to three after it. That's the number of drives you can lose from that device without losing any data. I like to think of it that way instead of ra uh, traditional RAID, because if I have a RAID Z3 sitting there, I can lose three of those eight drives and the system still performs. Think of RAID Z as buying you time to replace the failed drive. It's not, it's not keeping your data, it's just buying you time to replace the drive before you lose your data. All of the above commands to create a pool come from zpool create. A file system is part of a zpool. So you put your drives in the box, you say, okay, these drives are gonna be this zpool, and then in that zpool, you create a file system because you're drawing from your pool of disks to create a file system. A file system can have inherited properties. So if you say, okay, this Z pool, I'm gonna put compression on, and you can say everything below it is gonna um, have compression on, such as you're gonna have, say, slash var is gonna have compression on, then var temp, var db, whatever else is created in there by default will have compression on. You can override it in any, at any step along the way. The big advantage of pooling your drives, instead of giving a partition for each little part of the system that you used to do, is that you don't wind up having no space at all on var db, but 200 meg on slash user, and you say, what am I going to? You don't have to do a symlink from var db mysql to slash user local mysql, for example. This is a zpool. This is a zpool taken from a DigitalOcean droplet that I have that does a Nagios um, installation. This is the name of the zpool, how much drive space I ha uh, was allocated, used. Fragmentation is not the fragmentation that you think of when you think of fragmentation, so forget it. Capacity is how much of this I've used. And yeah, it's online. And ddupe, uh, don't use ddupe. Friends don't let friends use ddupe. You'll hear about it and you'll want to use it, but don't do it. Use compression instead. <laughs> so this is this whole file system based on that. Uh, this is set up for BE admin, sorry, boot environments. We'll talk about that later. But if you just ignore the Z root bit, you can basically see the file system, which is more or less mirrored over here. You don't have to do it that way. I could create 
zroot dan and mount it over here under user home dan. So your mount points are separate from your uh, file system names. These are your file system names all the way through here, and these are the mount points. Um, so let me just make sure I cover everything. Zroot is the name of the zpool. A zroot slash root is a data set file system within that pool. Zroot uh, root default. This one here. Oh, yeah, zroot root default is a descendant of root and is also a file system. So yeah, this is a file system. That's a file system. So is that. So is that. It does not have to be named root, by the way. It can be named whatever you want for this uh, boot environment. We'll get into boot environments later. Um, legacy. This legacy bit here, it means that the bootloader, vfs.root.mount from equals, gets set from zroot colon zroot default, basically in here. That's what the legacy means. And it's derived from the bootfs property of the pool. So each Z pool, you can say, okay, when you want to boot from here, boot from there. Which means you can turn the BIOS off in your HBA so it doesn't iterate all the drives and it boots up faster. Because I generally boot from a separate drive connected directly to the motherboard rather than off the HBA. Okay, what's a VDEB? Again, grossly, grossly Simplified because it's skipping over spares, logs, cache, and files, which you don't want to know about because we're, we're, this is a newbie talk. What's a VDEV? A VDEV is a single disk. A VDEV can be a mirror of two or more disks, or a VDEV can be a RAID Z, which we've already covered all these terms. So why do you need to know about a VDEV? Because you create a Z pool from a VDEV. Did I get that right? All right. So some of the terms I'm going to use, I'm going to constantly refer to <laughs> file systems and I'm going to refer to data sets. They are the same thing. Don't get confused by that. So a data set can be a file system, a volume, which is not commonly used, or it can be a snapshot. And we'll cover snapshots later, but that's a read-only version of a file system. These are some interesting properties you can set on a file system. Set a time off. If you don't set a time off, what happens is when you read something, it's going to write something every time. So it doubles your I.O. and a time isn't really as relevant as it used to be. Exec equals no is useful, especially if you put it on something sla like slash temp, because it means someone can't write a file there and then run it, which breaks I.O. cage. Uh, reservation means, hey, listen, we should keep 10 gigs spare on this file system, uh, or don't let anyone go over 5 gig on this file system. So you give space to your users, they have a writable directory, and you set a limit on it. When it comes time to replace a failed drive, step one is the important bit. You don't want to remove the wrong drive. Uh, some people will do a very clever thing which involves putting the serial number in the device name, which can be useful because then you can see which drive you're supposed to pull out. Um, so add the new drive in. Remember I didn't say remo remove the failing drive because you, your drive may be wonky, but your system is still perfectly intact. The Z pool is not degraded. And if you pull a drive out, your Z pool is degraded. And if another drive fails, then you've got an even bigger problem. So if you can, keep your existing drive in there until this process finishes, at which case the failing drive is no longer part of the zpool and you can just pull it out. So this is a system in which I did exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, this is uh, an old case. I'm not sure if I still have it, but I might have it. There's, uh, I think there's three HBAs up at the top here. And so I had to replace a drive. This was actually me um, replacing three terabyte drives with five terabyte drives. And yes, that is just sitting loose in the case. And there is actually, uh, uh, this may have been before I attached the power <laughs> cords and stuff. But I, put the, I took uh, one of my drives out of the drive bays down here and put it in there and then put a new drive in here. 
and then started replacing the three terabyte with five terabyte one at a time. Don't use RAID cards. Just like I said, friends don't let friends do something. What was it before? Dedupe. Friends don't let friends do, use RAID cards on ZFS. RAID hides stuff. So the RAID card will try to fix something and fix something and fix something and then say, oh no, this drive is dead, I can't do anything with it. And then ZFS says, what? Where'd my drive go? Whereas ZFS will try and fix the drive for you. It'll say, okay, this drive is having trouble reading from over here. Let me go over and check this drive because it's weird because I know it's going to be over here. Oh, it's there. It's just fine. Oh, I'll put this somewhere else over here. But it works. So ZFS will try and fix something if it can, and if it can't, it'll tell you that it failed. It won't silently give you a corrupted file. It'll tell you that it failed. Uh, so use HBA, not RAID. Scaling. If you need more space, you can do what I did earlier and upgrade all the drives. Replace three terabyte with five terabyte. Um, or you can add a new VDEV. We talked about VDEVs earlier. So you've got a mirror here of drives. You can just add another mirror. What you can't do is just uh, take a RAID Z something and add new drives. So you can't go from an eight drive RAID Z2 to a nine drive RAID Z2, because math is hard, like really hard to do that. So, but they are working on changing that. Um, so you may have heard that ZFS is not, not expandable. That's the bit that's not expandable. It is expandable where you can say, I have a Z pool with eight drives. It's a RAID Z2. Here's another eight drives, RAID Z2, Z, RAID Z2, stripe them. And it's done. It's striped. You've now doubled your space. This is the single most important reason to use ZFS, even if it's only one drive. It checksums everything. It puts it in metadata, and it's hierarchical. So basically, you write data down here in a file, and it puts a checksum here, but then it checksum it with the other data that matches up and all the way up to the top of the tree. It's checksums all the way down. So when it goes to read something, it checksums the data and looks at the checksum that's already on disk, and if it doesn't match, it goes to try and fix it. But if it can't fix it, it tells you. But it'll tell you about the errors, and it'll look for them and can correct it if it can. So the difference between that and a regular file system, well, a non-checksumming file system, is that you'll find out about the data being wrong instead of just being given this, here's this photograph, but one bit somewhere is wrong. Instead, you'll be told, here's this photograph, and the data's bad. Not so much important in a file, but, sorry, in a photograph, but maybe in a file that has a bunch of accounting figures in it, and one bit is changed. So, scrubs. What scrubs does is it reads all the data that you've written to the disk, and it reads it all and compares the checksums and reports any errors that it finds and attempts to fix any errors that you find. Always turn this on. And it's very easy to turn on. I do it every seven days. You can do it every month, however frequent you want to do it. Just make sure you don't do it more frequent than it takes to run. I've got some scrubs that take about 24 hours to run, but they won't overlap. Snapshots are the most fantastic thing for backups. One of the biggest problems with backups is that you will start your backup, let's say, at midnight, and you'll be backing up all these files. And by the time you finish at 2.30 a.m., this log file over here doesn't match this log file over here, because this log file stops at midnight, and this log file stops at 2.30, because they're constantly being written. What you can do with a snapshot, because it's read-only, is you can take a snapshot at midnight, and every single file as of midnight is in that snapshot. It does not change for the lifetime of the backup. So you take a snapshot, you back up the snapshot. You don't back up the live file system, you back up the snapshot. And it's an instant in time. Uh, snapshots are usually very quick. So you do a snapshot, it's done. Yesterday I, a, I discovered a snapshot that started running on Friday the 13th. I had to reboot the system. 
Nobody could figure out what was going on. Snapshots cannot be modified. So they're good in terms of, I don't know if they would pass, say, some legal requirements for, for images or files, but they can't be changed. That's why I like them for backups. And, but keep in mind, snapshots in the same host are not backups. But you can send a snapshot to another host. So you've got a host on the East Coast, and you've got a host on the West Coast. Take a snapshot, and you send it to the other host. You can share a snapshot from any system to another system, or even in a system to within the same system. It's just an ability to say, OK, ZFS send, pipe, ZFS receive. It's a little more complex than that, but it is a useful way to do backups. Send them wherever you want, because snapshots on another host are read-only and are a copy of the data offline. Well, offline relative to the first system. We talked briefly about mirrors before. Two more drives with duplicate content, but you can also stripe over mirrors. So basically, you have a set of mirrors here and a set of mirrors there, and you stripe over both of them. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as RAID 10 because the RAID 1 is the mirror and the 10 is the striping over the two. RAID 0 is usually referred to as striping. But in, in a stripe over two mirrors, you can lose two drives so long as they're not in the same mirror before you die. So briefly talked about RAID Z. So you need at least four drives to do RAID Z. And that'll get your RAID Z1. But the more drives you have, the higher this number can come. <coughs> and this is the beauty. You can lose N drives and still be operational. And by operational, I mean the system will continue to run. It's not like, oh my god, the system can't run because I'm missing two. No, it just runs. One of the most neat things I use on ZFS is mounting within mounts. So I have a bunch of slow drives for the main system, two old uh, spinning disks, and that's what I boot from. They're directly connected to the motherboard. But then I have a database that I run, run on this system, so I add in a couple of SSDs for that database, and I create the zpool on the SSDs, but then mount them in VARDB Postgres, which is just a mount point on the main system. And your, your code doesn't care it's on a different file system. It's completely hidden, and it just works. You can also do this with slash temp. Put slash temp on the fast drives as well. So here's an example of me doing exactly that for Pudre, where I have my Z root with my smaller drives here, but then I have my fast tank with a lot of space here. And you can see that Pudre is mounted at user local Pudre, and that's just part of user, and it's completely transparent to anything else that I'm doing. This is also another way to expand the system. If you don't want to uh, touch your original RAID Z, you can just put the space where you want it. You can do a whole bunch of mount points like this. Boot environments. A boot environment is a ZFS file system uh, designed for booting. And there's a few requirements for that. Um, but we're not going to get into what the actual requirements for, are for a boot environment. We're just going to show you what you can do with it, because you're going to like it. Basically, you can manage boot environments with BE admin or BE CTL. BE admin has been around a bit longer. BE CTL is now in base on FreeBSD, I think. Uh, BE admin is in port. Basically, what it does is it saves your current boot environment. And the use case that we're going to use is we're going to upgrade from FreeBSD 11.3 uh, to FreeBSD 12. So what you do is you save your current boot environment. And what that does, basically, is it clones the environment that you're booting from now. After you've done that, you upgrade your current environment, and then you reboot. And if it's all OK, great. If it's not, you reboot. And during the reboot process, you choose the boot environment that you saved away. Here's an example. 
See this magic option here, number seven? I press number seven here, and I get that, which is my default, and I change it to that, which is really difficult to read, but that's the other boot environment. And then I boot it back in to 11.3. So anytime you're doing updates, anytime you're doing major changes, you can use boot environments for something like that. You can also use it for booting new kernels if you're doing a lot of kernel work. Next boot is the neat thing that you can use for that because all you do is you say, on my next boot, boot from this. And then the next boot after that is what you were using before. So it is truly just boot once from this other thing. So we're going to go through some very simple configuration things. Here, we're creating a, a, a partition on DA0. We add a ZFS uh, partition. This is just 4K alignment. This is a label, which is the serial number of the drive. And boom, that's what looks like there. And you've got the ZFS partition. And then what I do is I've done the same thing with my other drive. And I say, ZooPool, create. This is the name of the ZPool. I'm call it, it's going to be a mirror, and it's going to be on those two drives. And bang, there's my ZPool. Now, this is actually an older ZPool because I actually did a scrub on this. But you can see that it is, it is called NVD. It doesn't match up with my data because this is actually uh, taken from one system and then modified to suit the example. Ignore that part. Uh, basically, here's mirror zero. And if you had a stripe of mirrors, you could duplicate these three lines just down below here. We'll see that in the next example. So here we've got four drives, and we're going to create a RAID Z1. Uh, again, it's going to be called My Data, and it's RAID Z1, and it's four drives. What does that look like? RAID Z2, we just add another drive. RAID Z, uh, we'll get to RAID Z3 next. But there's the RAID Z2. You can see the, four, the, the five, one, the six drive. One of them has a serial number in it. So there's the RAID Z3 with six drive. Uh, there's a RAID Z1. Again, you ba basically give it a name, say I'm going to mirror those two drives, and I'm going to mirror those two drives. And you can repeat that process as far down the page as you have drives. And there's a, a RAID Z, um, a ra RAID 10, a mirror, a mirror, and it's striped over the two. Talk briefly about quotas. It's on a data set. It's a limit on how much space you can use, and it includes the descendants. So if you let your user create new file systems, it's all going to be included in there. The other thing is it includes snapshots. Because although you take a snap, if you take a snapshot and then delete a five gig file, it doesn't free up the space because it's still involved in the snapshot. So you've got to keep that in mind that snapshots, when you make them, that space will stay around until you delete the snapshot. Yeah, and I don't want to get into this stuff because even I have trouble figuring out what it means. Uh, remember to scrub. Uh, you can create a Nagios uh, script for doing that. Uh, also run ZPool status because that tells you if there's any problems. Uh, monitor quotas and monitor the capacity, and there are scripts for doing all of that, easily available. Uh, now we're going to go through some myth busting, because there's a lot of bad advice that sits out there. So I said this before, a single drive with ZFS is better than no ZFS at all. So just try it, and you will enjoy it. ECC is not required. People will say, you've got to use ECC with ZFS. But ZFS with the ECC is better than no ZFS at all. You need high-end hard hardware. No, you don't. Most of my systems are consumer grade. They're definitely not enterprise. Uh, you can get an HBA for about $100 off eBay. Uh, I do have some super micro chassis because I bought myself birthday presents, and they were very much nicer than what I had before. Uh, when you're looking for hardware, look to the FreeNAS community because they figured this all out already, especially for consumer-grade stuff. Lots of RAM. 
No, that's not true either. I have a system running with one gig of RAM. Uh, and that one system runs with 250 gig free, 250 meg free, sorry. And that's the digital ocean droplet th that I have. It's very slow when I go to the web page, but it's just for monitoring. I don't, I don't need speed, I just need it to monitor. Oh, so this isn't a tip from last night. This is more like a tip from sometime in August. But put your OS on a ZFS, put your operating system on a, on a ZFS mirror and put your data on the rest. Um, because then you, you can actually, uh, you could actually use UFS on the OS instead. But whatever you do, don't boot from the HBA. And the reason I say that is if you have your boot drives spread across seven or eight drives in your RAID Z, the HBA is going to choose one of them to boot from. And that means you have to iterate through all those drives uh, during the boot process. You can speed up your boot process by turning off the BIOS on your drive if you're booting from things directly connected to the motherboard. And the, the main reason I like booting from the motherboard is it eliminates any problems that you might have with the HBA. If your RAID Z gives out or the <coughs> HBA gives out, you can probably still boot off the motherboard. I just think it removes complexity from your booting. I got some tips from Savage Light. She's here. I don't know if she's in the room, but she is at the conference. Oh. That's not good. There's this one button down here that takes me out of it. I already mentioned this. Tell your BIOS to ignore the HBA. So it's fewer drives to scan, that goes faster. You can safely partition SSDs using the OS. So basically, you've got your two SSDs you get the OS mounted on. You don't need all that space for the, S for, for the OS. You only need what? two, three gig for the operating system. You can partition other bits of that SSD and use it for other things. Create another Z pool. So basically, the same drive is involved in multiple Z pools. And I do that, I do that at home. Uh, set your record size very big for files that have uh, large data. You can go, you can get another five to 10 it was a significant percentage. I don't want to say how much it was, but it was a significant percentage. We changed the record size on, on some drives. Ooh. When I restarted this, it lost my time. So basically, I've been going about a half hour now, right? We started at 10.30. So we covered a lot of stuff. I went through that way faster than I thought I would. Coffee helps. <laughs> There must be questions because there's a lot. I bet you this can move. Just so it gets recorded. Uh, so two questions from uh, Newbie. You said that uh, snapshots are good for backup, but they're read-only. So how do you restore? Um, you just restore as you would, and you restore it over the main file system. You don't restore into the backup. Yeah, but uh, if you send your snapshot back, it's still read-only, right? Yeah. So you remove the read-only flag and you're done? Or, I mean, no, how, no, no. How, how do you make it read-write again? What you can do is you, uh, there's a hidden directory called .zfs at yes. the top of every file system. And if you just want one file, you can do cd .zfs slash snapshot slash whatever you name the snapshot down to where you have the file, and you can copy it over. Or you can do a ZFS rollback, but that rolls back everything. Now, what I mean is, suppose you uh, make a snapshot of your data set. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, uh, send it to another data center, yep. and uh, in your original data center, there was a disaster, so you mm -hmm. lost everything. Now you want to restore. So you have a read-only mm -hmm. snapshot waiting for you to That's restore. That's a good point. Is the thing that you sent actually read-only? No, I don't think it is, because it's not a snapshot. Anyone done this already? Is this cut the receipt? Yeah. 
Like what you've received is not read only, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah. Use the set of percent the rest received and the use the right use the microphone so that it's repeat what has been said. Good. Yeah, so you just do a ZFS send of your snapshot, pipe it into the ZFS receive. Is it doing anything? Closer, closer. Right. You do a ZFS send over to your other system, ZFS receive, which unpacks it as a new ZFS in the system, and it's read write on the other system. Yep. yep. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I have a question regarding terminology. You said ZFS, but Z pool. Mm -hmm. Why? Why isn't there a Z pool? Habit. <laughs> Habit. Because Z pool doesn't sound very good. And yeah, um, Canadian, so it, it is Z, if, is, is it? I don't know. Uh, my vocabulary changes. I don't know. What, what do Americans say? Another question? So uh, to keep the <coughs> flame wars and uh, I, I mean the religious wars away, very briefly, your comment or your comparison of ZFS with ButterFS. Oh, oh that's easy. I've never used ButterFS. <laughs> When you are asking about the uh, zpool, why is that vdev? Oh, uh, zpool is cons consists of vdevs, right? Right. I always have trouble remembering this myself and figuring it out. I just know that I create a zpool out of trouble. I would expect like zdevs, but okay. Oh, virtual device, I think, is what 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 it means. But, uh, I have a question about the partitions. You, but before you add a, a drive to a zpool, you partition it with GPT. Yes. And I don't know why, because the drives may have slightly different sizes or something, or um, what's the reason? Linux tends to just give it a whole drive. Uh, FreeBSD tends to partition it and give it the partition. Uh, that allows you to do a lot of things. I think the main reason is because you can do a lot of magic with Geom if you have the partitions, but if you have the raw drive, you can't. The other reason is give it a partition don't use all the drive, so that then if you have to replace it with another drive, which may be slightly smaller, even though it's advertised as the same size, you can just reduce the partition a little bit and you, you haven't run into a bad place. More questions? So who hasn't used ZFS yet? All that, all right. So it's been around a long time. It works. It's pretty solid. Once you get into the bigger drives, you don't have to worry about the uh, FSEC at the beginning. If no more questions, we're done. Thank you.